As we begin, let us remember in prayer a student from one of our sections whose mother died from the coronavirus yesterday. And together with that student, all those who are losing people and grieving those they love from this pandemic, let's ask the Lord to deliver us from this evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is the fourth lecture in our online portion of the course. And today, the question really is about how different views of who Jesus is lead to different views of what redemption is, and vice versa. How do particular views of human redemption lead to different views about Jesus' identity? On the left-hand side there, I have uh, placed the icon of the Council of Nicaea. And you see in the middle... Emperor Constantine, who convened the council, and around him are the council fathers, the bishops of the church at that time. And they are holding in front of them the creed that was formulated at that council, the same creed that Catholics profess at every Sunday Mass. And it's an extremely important event, an extremely important formula of faith that continues to this day, and we will talk about its importance in this lecture today. But before we do that, I thought that I would at least try to unpack the question a little bit for today by thinking about the symbiosis of Christology and redemption, the way that views of Jesus lead to particular understandings of what human salvation is, and vice versa, how experiences of salvation lead to particular beliefs about who Jesus is. And I would just want to point out that historically, chronologically, from our own perspective, this way of thinking about who Jesus is really begins with the experience of salvation. The whole reason why this is a question, who really is Jesus? Is he only human? Is he more than human? If he is more than human, how does whatever dimension of his identity is more than human relates to his humanity. The only reason why this is even a question is because people encountered him in history and had an extraordinary experience of healing and wholeness as a result of his actions, his words. And it was this sort of experience that led to a conviction that Jesus was somehow either a messenger from God, uh, the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God made human, and even God himself uh, in human form. That experience, though, inevitably leads to thought, leads to reflection about who this person is. But the flow also goes the other way as well convictions or beliefs about who Jesus could possibly be constrain and form the way people understand what salvation is, what human redemption consists in. Particularly given certain presumptions about who God is, what human beings are, what sort of union is possible between them, you also have, moving backwards, a way of shaping how we understand what salvation is. But for the apostles and those around him originally, the experience of his healing people, making them whole, of unlocking for them the key to their own existence, came first. I also wanted to discuss very briefly what it could possibly mean to call Jesus the Word of God. So this phrase, the Word of God, is really interchangeable with the Son of God, it refers to that aspect of Jesus' divine nature that unites with his human nature, 
but is nevertheless distinct from the one Jesus called Father. Whatever divine reality entered human form through Jesus is what Christians call the Son of God or the Word of God. Now, this particular phrase, the Word of God, comes from this Greek philosophical term, logos. You see it in written there in the Greek on the right. Uh, we may have mentioned this before. Its most immediate surface meaning is word. It is the word for word. The English word for word is word. The Greek word would be logos. And so it could just mean a unit of speech, you know, a, an ingredient to a sentence. But it means something more than that. It can mean speech itself. Uh, so this is kind of the meaning given at Mass when they say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The speech or language coming from God is also called the word of God. Or I'll take you at my, I'll take you at your word, that sort of way of using it. But the Greek uh, meaning also includes rationality as a whole, which is also the reason why we get the word logic in our language from this Greek word logos. But it could mean even more than that. The logos of something is really the principle of its intelligibility, the reason why it's understandable. So you might think of the English word rationale or the... Uh, idea that to see something and perceive something is different than merely understanding it. What allows it to be understandable, what allows us to make sense of something is in a sense distinct from the thing itself. And this principle of intelligibility, what allows things to be understood by the human mind, the Greeks would also call logos. And if you brought it out even further, you could apply this to the cosmos as a whole. And refer to the logos of the cosmos, the logos of the universe. And this could be thought of as like the blueprint of all reality. What is the underlying order and intelligibility behind everything taken as a whole? This would also be called the logos. And as you see here, we're kind of getting into pretty broad philosophical territory, if not theological territory. For Christians, when they adopt this word, they're really referring to an aspect or dimension of God himself. So it's really referring to God's own understanding of himself, which is necessarily perfect and necessarily contained within God's own being, because there's nothing outside of or apart or distinct from God's being. And so, like us, if God not only knows that he exists, but has a certain understanding of who or what he is. Unlike us, that understanding cannot be wrong. And it is so perfect, in fact, that Christians believe it is its own hypostasis. This is the fancy Greek word for its own thing, its own center of reality, of agency, its own person. Uh, it is so complete that you cannot think of it other than as God himself. So unlike us, we know that uh, we exist, we know something about ourselves, that we have a privileged understanding of who we are, but the experience of discovering things about yourself that you didn't know before is fairly common. So our knowledge of ourselves is not perfect and complete, but God's is. And that perfect self-understanding, that perfect uh, consciousness of his own reality, it's contained within God's own being and is in a sense an aspect or dimension of God himself. Nevertheless, there's a distinction there between God as knower and God as object known. So the understanding God has of his own self is what Christians would refer to as the word of God the perfect understanding God has of himself, which is in its, in its own way uh, as much God as God the Father. So it's the principle of God's own intelligibility. It's what allows God himself to, in a sense, be intelligible to himself. 
but allows him to make sense of himself. Uh, and in this respect, it is identified by Christians as kind of the catalyst of creation, that which is the origin and the vehicle for God's creating the world. And again, this is kind of on analogy with human creation. It's only by stepping back and having a kind of reflective idea of what one wants to do that one can then begin to create something. Uh, so the word of God is that by which God infuses order to creation and perfectly brings about that which he intends to bring about. But as a human person, in Jesus Christ, Christians see the very word of God and what they're seeing is, in a sense, a microcosm of God's creative act itself. They see in Jesus the embodiment of the meaning and purpose of all creation. They see the key that unlocks the order and intelligibility, the rationale of everything that exists. And so in a sense, it's kind of like a painting that has a particular component that is really the purpose of the whole painting, that really unlocks the meaning of the whole painting. And Christians see in Jesus uh, a being acting in space and time that is itself the meaning and center of all of creation from beginning to end. All right, that's pretty deep and dense. Let's try to apply it, though, to human redemption. If Christians call Jesus the divine logos, if this is one of the claims they make about him, then how does this bear upon their understanding of human redemption? Well, as we said, the rationale of all creation, the logos, becomes a creature like us. That's really the meaning of the claim. Jesus Christ is the word of God, is the logos made flesh. That means that a creature like us can embody God's own self-understanding. The intelligibility of everything, in a sense, can take form as a human person. It's, it's really a, a radical, mind-blowing uh, realization, and not without its controversy. The further implication, though, if you add that to Jesus' own invitation to dwell in him, to unite in him, to live in him, and also his action of offering his followers his own spirit, his own breath of life. This opens up the possibility that perhaps we as creatures, as the types of creatures we are, can somehow participate in God's own being, in God's own self, through this perfect self-understanding which appears to us in human form of what God is. This perhaps is a way of unpacking or explaining this fourth reason the Catechism gives for why the word became flesh, namely that Jesus allows us to become partakers of the divine life. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it isn't just kind of a otherworldly transcendent reality or spiritual inner reality. It refers to the way in which Jesus' humanity bridges the creation and the creator and allows creatures like us to embody that which is in God that makes creation possible. Okay, so now we'll switch gears a little bit, provide some context for what follows, just by outlining some important dates in early Christian history. And this is uh, going to be very brief and cursory. We can't really unpack a lot of this, but it's important to have a kind of map within which you can place some of the events we'll talk about later. So, of course, Jesus lives from the year zero, which is dated to Jesus' birth, the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, to somewhere in the early 30s. So if you just think of zero to 30 as kind of the era of Jesus' own life, ministry, uh, when he lives and dies. The next 70 years, 30 to 100 AD, are what's often called the apostolic age. Uh, this is the age where the people who witnessed Jesus, who lived with him, who were his followers, uh, did their own thing and, uh, you know, had their own ministries and writings. And uh, once those people are gone, you have a turning point. Now, within this period of time, we have some several, we have several important events 
the first one being the conversion of, of St. Paul in the year 46 AD. St. Paul was an enormously important figure in early Christian history, spread the faith to the Gentiles, and was largely responsible for the really international spread of the faith. A couple years later, in 48 AD, we have another really significant event, the Council of Jerusalem. It was here where the church decided to include Gentiles within the Christian community without requiring them to assimilate to Jewish law and, in a sense, become Jewish themselves. St. Paul was the advocate of this position. St. Peter famously offered resistance to it, but ultimately St. Paul's position won out at this council, and Gentiles were welcomed into the body of Christ without having to become fully uh, Jewish, without having to be circumcised and follow the kosher laws and that kind of thing. So the next major date would be the persecution of Nero. This was 64 to 68 AD, this roughly four-year period in which the emperor Nero decided to go after the Christian community. And several victims of this persecution included Saints Peter and St. Paul. St. Peter was martyred in 64 AD by being crucified upside down. St. Paul followed a few years later. Most people think this was around 67 AD by beheading since he was a Roman citizen. They were both killed in Rome. And this marks the era of early Christian persecution and martyrdom. In the year 70 AD, we have the destruction of Jerusalem and the great temple there in Jerusalem. Uh, the destruction of the temple marked a significant event in the history of uh, the Jewish people, of course. It's never been rebuilt to this day. And so the whole uh, Jewish faith and Jewish tradition was transformed once the temple was gone. The next 30 years, we have the writing of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, it's in this period of time that the apostles, perhaps realizing they're not going to be around forever, record these definitive accounts of Jesus' life and its meaning. The last one being the Gospel of John, which was written in about 100 AD. Okay, so this whole period of time, first three centuries of the church, was marked most by persecution and martyrdom from the ruling authorities, particularly from the Roman authorities. And you have several very prominent martyrs that shape the theology and practice of the early church at this time. Uh, Justin Martyr, St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, St. Polycarp, St. Perpetua. These people were martyred in Roman arenas, tried for their faith, and their refusal to renounce their Christian faith led to their deaths. It's also interesting to note that the first 33 popes were also killed for their faith. It's kind of remarkable. Not really a great job to have, I guess, at that time. But the first 33 popes did except martyrdom. Several notable emperors who brought about these persecutions, of course Nero, followed by him the emperor Domitian, and then Decius, and then the final one, Diocletian. Diocletian at the end of the third, uh, beginning of the fourth century, conducted what's called the Great Persecution, which is really sort of the last gasp of the Roman persecution against the Christians, and, and it may have been the worst just in terms of its extent. Um, but then a huge turning point came at the, er at the early part of the 4th century. In the year 312, the emperor at the time, Emperor Constantine, decided uh, to take Jesus Christ as a kind of divine patron before a pivotal battle called the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And Constantine was primarily the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire with his base in Byzantium, which came to be known as Constantinople. And before this battle, he received a vision of the Cairo, a Christian symbol. It kind of looks like a P with an X on the stem. And the message attending the vision said, in this sign you will conquer. In this sign you shall conquer. And so he sort of provisionally accepts Jesus Christ as his patron for this battle. And then they win the battle, and he becomes the 
uh, undisputed emperor of the Roman Empire and begins to really finalize and make definitive the legalization of Christianity. I mean, it was somewhat underway at this time. Emperor Gallienus uh, lifted the explicit persecutions, which hadn't been really enforced for several years. But it was Emperor Constantine who, with the Edict of Milan in 313, legalized Christianity. And then very shortly after, Christianity becomes the official faith of the Roman world. So it's after 313 that it not only becomes legal to practice the Christian faith, but eventually it becomes the official privileged faith of, of the Roman Empire and then eventually the Christian world. So the Council of Nicaea, which I mentioned at the beginning, happens only 12 years after this Edict of Milan. Uh, and it was convened by that same emperor, Emperor Constantine, in order to settle matters of Christian belief, which were undefined and uh, disputed. Okay, so let's turn then now to the eighth chapter of Mark Zia's book, The Faith Understood. And this chapter is about the incarnation and the work of redemption. There's a lot of uh, sort of redundancy uh, a lot of the same stuff, a lot of overlap in this chapter, but there are a few notable additions and contributions that he makes that I want to briefly go over. So Zia mentions that docetism, the belief that Jesus only appeared to be human, was really just God, was advocated by Gnostic sects, by this group called the Manichees. They were led by this uh, Persian mystic named Mani, they held some of the main beliefs about the world, as Gnostics did, that spirit was good, matter was evil. But they really doubled down on the idea that the universe is really divided up to, into good and evil. And here's our New York Deli cookie here to illustrate that. Manichees thought there was a principle of light and principle of darkness. There was an ultimate uh, reality of goodness or ultimate reality of evil in the world. And these were always doing battle with each other. And whenever there was an imbalance, the other would kind of take over to compensate. So they also adopted this idea of docetism that saw Jesus as perhaps a messenger from uh, the good side of the universe. You know, it's, this is very much in, in line with the Star Wars mythology, you know, the, the dark side and the light, the Sith and the Jedi. Uh, and so Jesus might have come from the side of light, but his humanity, his materiality could not have possibly been real then because materiality, the human body, is part of the material world that is evil. What are some practical implications, though, of this belief that Jesus was only an apparent human, that he was just a hologram, his humanity was an illusion? Well, one interesting one is that salvation does not involve the body. That may seem straightforward enough. It's the body itself is evil. But that means that bodily suffering cannot really have any part in our redemption. Your body suffers because it's evil. It's just sort of a sign or symptom of its being from the evil part of reality. And so that experience really has no meaning in itself. And therefore, the experience of martyrdom can also have really no meaning. It's pointless and misguided. So the early Christian experience was really shaped and formed by martyrdom. The Gnostics and the Manichees stood against that by saying, there's really no point in giving over your body to death for the sake of your faith. Your body really can't have anything to do with your faith. Uh, so that suffering really doesn't mean anything. It's not really a part of your experience of salvation. This was a major point of contention between Docetists and uh, Orthodox Christians. And Zia even quotes St. Ignatius of Antioch who opposed the Docetists by saying that if he wasn't really human, if he did not in reality take unto him a body and died only in appearance, then why do I suffer? For what reason am I now in bonds and long to be exposed to the wild beasts? So Christians at this time were undergoing a lot of suffering, a lot of persecution. The Gnostics and people like them, the Docetists, 
said, uh, there's no reason for this. You should just, you know, kind of say the words they want you to say. You should avoid this sort of suffering, especially publicly, uh, because the bodily aspect of your salvation is really superfluous. It doesn't mean anything. What really matters is what's going on in your mind, what you know, what's going on in your spirit. They also believed, incidentally, that sex and procreation are evil. Uh, again, they're just very bodily uh, procreation, you know, why would you want to bring into this evil material universe any new spiritual beings? Uh, and so they were also very much opposed to uh, sexual union, to marriage, to procreation. Um, so some interesting things to add about docetism. All right, what does Zia say about adoptionism and Arianism? I thought I would at least point out here maybe where these two patterns of heresy overlap. Um, so adoptionism is associated most with this guy, Paul of Samosata, who was a bishop of Antioch, a prominent city in northern Syria. And he was the leading advocate of adoptionism. And it was Paul of Samosata that the Council of Nicaea was really targeting in its conclusions, along with Ari Arius. So... Paul of Samosata and Arius are really the, the two major uh, opponents of the Nicene Creed, as we'll see. Arius of Alexandria, you mentioned him before. He was an influential Egyptian priest and a leading advocate of Arianism. So what common ground do these two heresies have? Adoptionism, you may remember, the belief that the word of God adopted the human person, Jesus, at some point in his life, either baptism or the resurrection, some believe. And Arius' belief that it was really a high, exalted creature that became human. The Word of God is not fully God, but God's first and highest creation. And so God really doesn't completely enter the human uh, realm. It's only his highest and most exalted creature, the Son of God, the Word of God. What do these two views have in common? Well, I propose that they both preserve for God a kind of escape clause. In both of these heresies, God has an out to the parts of the human experience that really are distasteful, that don't seem really consistent with God's transcendence or perfection. For adoptionism, this out is really the possibility of detachment. So adoptionism supposes that at some point the Word of God can attach himself to the human person, Jesus, similarly to, to Nestorianism. But that also means that he can detach himself, perhaps when things get too rough or when certain experiences are inconsistent with God's transcendence and perfection. The out that Arius gives to God is one of delegation. So if the word of God is not fully God, but kind of the vice president of heaven, you know, the number two next to God, then really anything that could go wrong, anything which doesn't seem fully in line with who God is, you can just point to the fact that, well, this is just the chief lieutenant of God. This really isn't fully God himself. So things about Jesus that you may not want to attribute to God himself, you can say, well, this is particular distinctive to the word of God, who really isn't fully God. Both of those cases, it just gives you a way of getting around certain discomforts and certain things about the incarnation that may seem um, not in line with what you think God is. But as we'll see, this also has an implication on our understanding of, of redemption. Okay, so the Council of Nicaea, which say something about this now. This is an icon on the left there of the Council of Nicaea. You see the guy uh, on the floor there with his ears covered in a prone position. He is Arius. He is the one whose views are rejected. This is sort of the show that the Council affirmed a certain belief about the son's relationship to the father, but also rejected certain other beliefs. You see the guy with the crown there to the right of the, uh, presumably the Holy Scriptures there in the center, that's Emperor Constantine. 
And then you have on the left uh, St. Clement of Rome, the Pope at the time, and all the church fathers surrounding them. This council originated from a call by the Roman Emperor Constantine for the churches to meet and work out some discrepancies in their profession of faith and what they really believe about who Jesus is and his relationship to God. So he was the civil ruler of the time, the emperor. He wanted to make Christianity the official religion of, of the Roman world. In order to do that, though, he needed a little bit more unity. He basically said to these church fathers, figure out what you believe so we can standardize it and apply it universally. So we know what we're dealing with, we know what to teach. And uh, so that was their uh, commission. And they were supposed to define the belief specifically about the relationship between God the Son and God the Father. Some principal players in this council, you have Constantine, of course, and also St. Athanasius of Alexandria. He was perhaps the most influential theological and ecclesiastical figure at the council. He was the bishop of the prominent North uh, Egyptian city of Alexandria which is really the center of learning at the time. This is where the big library, the pharaohs was. This is where the greatest universities and thinkers would be. Uh, and St. Athanasius was the leader of the church there. And he advocated the view that will come to be uh, articulated in the creed. Sometimes the creed we say at Mass is even called the Athanasian Creed because... It was the view of the son's relationship to the father that St. Athanasius advocated. He also was a very fierce opponent of Arius of Alexandria. You see there a picture of Arius, who was a very influential free priest from the same city of Alexandria. And he inspired communities of Christians who centered their faith around the idea that Jesus was the son of the father who was begotten at a particular time and so was derivative of god the father and so not fully equal and not the same essence with the father also of note saint nicholas of mira yes saint nicholas santa claus this was the very widely revered bishop of mira which was a town in asia minor at that time today it's turkey and St. Nicholas felt so strongly in favor of the Athanasian position that in the middle of the council, he got up and slapped Arius across the face. And you see there a ancient portrayal of this event. And there are some other ones too. But uh, you should know that he was put in the brig for this. He was uh, taken out of the council and put in jail basically for accosting one of the other council participants. But when he was uh, jailed, he received a vision from Our Lady with the baby Jesus, who consoled him and affirmed the rightness of his position. He would later share this vision with others uh, who would corroborate its authenticity. And so he was eventually championed. But yeah, things got physical there at the Council of Nicaea. Not all that unusual for the ancient world. Uh, but uh, it's just kind of a funny twist on the jolly old uh, Saint Nick there who isn't afraid to mix it up when necessary when matters are important. Okay, the other thing to mention about what was at stake in the Council of Nicaea is a particular word and really the choice between that word and a very close alternative. There is a phrase in the English language one iota of difference uh, it doesn't make one iota of difference well this comes exactly from uh, the controversy at Nicaea as we'll see an iota the insertion of one letter the equivalent of the letter I in our alphabet would have changed completely the nature of the Christian faith what Christians believe about Jesus relationship to the Father and so this word is homoousios which you see there in Roman and Greek letters homoousios comes from the two words homo, which means the same, and usia, which means essence or substance. So homo usios is an adjective, and it basically means of one essence, of one substance, the same reality. We're dealing with something that is equal at its core, at its heart, essentially equal 
to another thing. And so this was employed to say at the Council of Nicaea that the Son is no less God than the Father. The Son is homoousios, of one essence with the Father. This often gets translated as one in being or one in substance, consubstantial, I think is the word in the creed's day. And it's basically referring to just the claim that the Son is exactly as much God as the Father is. Well, what's the other word? Oh, first. The analogy that gets included in the creed comes from the experience of lighting candles. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Some of you may have wondered, what is, what's the deal with that light from light thing? Well, the analogy being employed here is when you have a candle that is lit, you have a candle that is not lit, the fire from the candle that's lit, when it's passed to the unlit candle, creates something new and distinctive, right? Another flame. But that flame that's created is the same essential thing as that from which it came. So this is the analogy that's employed and still professed today in the creed. When God begets the Son, he begets something that is of the same essence, that is no different at its core than where it came from. But of course, when you talk about God, you're also talking about something like eternal being. So if God begets something or brings forth something that is exactly the same in essence as himself, then that being is also going to be eternal and will exist from all time. It gets kind of mind-bending, but uh, the analogy of the candle is the creed's best attempt to explain it. All right, so what happens then when you add this I to the word homoousios? And the word here is homoousios, right? So close, homoousios. It's just one little letter. But this word means not one essence or one substance, but of similar substance, similar essence. So it's kind of, sort of one in essence, really. That I adds a sort of note of qualification there. You might think of it in terms of like a wax figure. It's hyper-realistic. Over there you see the real Leonardo DiCaprio on the left, the wax figure of Leonardo DiCaprio on the right. They look very similar, right? The one on the right is very much like the other, maybe as alike as possible, as alike as you can get a creation, something that's made, but not the same, right? Uh, what is like the other is really very much like it, but not equivalent not of the same essence or substance. It's just really, really similar, like a great resemblance, and therefore not equal. Right? So those two things, even though they do resemble each other very much, are not equal in dignity, uh, are not equal in their complexity. Right. So the creature that most resembles God is not the same as God, not equal to God. That was the Arian claim. So the Arians wanted to use homo eusios in the creed of similar substance with the father. But they decided ultimately on the deletion of the iota. And we have the creed that we have today, which professes an equality, a oneness of essence in every way. One interesting heresy that gets added to the Zia readings is Apollinarianism. It's very intriguing. It comes from... This um, bishop, Apollinarius, who lived in the 4th century, he would have been 15 years old at the Council of Nicaea. Nevertheless, he believed that Jesus was fully divine, but that he was so divine that there was really no human soul left in him. It was the bishop of Laodicea in Syria and fiercely opposed Arius, and maybe went a little bit too far in a certain direction. Jesus is fully divine, so divine, in fact, that he didn't have to have a human soul at all. Well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus' human soul, when the divine word assumed human form, was completely absorbed by the divine word. Now, soul here means something like mind 
or consciousness. Uh, it isn't just sort of like the inner self. It, it specifically refers to the thinking, feeling, conscious part of the human person. And so it's distinct from the mere body. We might portray it this way. Somebody's body and their mind is in their body. You know, the source or seat of consciousness. Something may be distinct, but contained within the body. But back then, their mind or consciousness was perceived to be immaterial. So you could have a fully human body and yet at least imagine that the mind or consciousness was something completely different. We have a little bit of that experience today where you can distinguish between you and your body. But back then the distinction was even stronger. And so Apollinarius uh, capitalized on that distinction and said, Jesus's body was fully human like everybody else. But he was fully God. In fact, he was so God that there was really no human mind in him. Only the divine mind, only the divine consciousness was in him. Okay, so think about what this means, though. Jesus' body is human. His soul, his mind, his spirit, his consciousness. Okay, that's what's God. So that is what is divine in Jesus. So in order to become human, in a sense, Apollinarius is saying the divine soul had to displace Jesus' human soul. He had to carve out a space in which the divine mind could dwell. And you may even say Jesus is like us in all things but his mind, all things but his consciousness. It's very easy to think this, right? Because you wonder, what, if Jesus Christ was God, did, did he not know something? Did he not know what you were going to say? Was he completely omniscient in the way that God alone is. That would be kind of odd, right? There would definitely be uh, more than what is usual for the human mind or human consciousness. So Apollinarius fully embraced this. He said, yeah, well, of course. Jesus' mind was really God's mind. It was just working through a human body. So in this, in, in this heresy, I would just invite you to consider this question. If Jesus is fully human with just a sort of a carved out space where his human mind used to be and the divine mind is inserted in that space, does this make Apollinarianism docetous because Jesus only appears to have a human soul, but really the soul is divine. He only appears to have a human mind. It's just a fully divine mind there, though. Or are we dealing with monophysitism because Jesus is a kind of hybrid of the human body and the divine soul, sort of like the centaur, right? What do you want to do when you make a centaur? Well, well, you can cut off a human being's legs and cut off a horse's head and then combine the two parts that are remaining, and then you got a centaur, right? Well, sort of like uh, something like that's going on here. Apollinarianism wants to amputate the human mind or consciousness and then insert the divine mind where that space should be. So is it, is it docetist, is it monophysite, or does it fall into another pattern? You might want to think about that and consider it. That could be something that you might want to contribute to in your discussion board if you come to the live Zoom discussion meetings. All right, what does Zia have to contribute about Nestorianism? He puts it this way, really. It was a choice at that Council of Ephesus in 431 AD as to whether we would call Mary Christotokos or Theotokos. Christotokos means the bearer of Christ. Theotokos means the bearer of God. Of course, bearer here meaning mother. Uh, so is Mary merely the mother of Christ, the mother of the human Jesus, maybe even the mother of the Messiah, but not really the mother of God. I mean, whatever is God and Jesus, that's really not connected with Mary's motherhood, is it? That was the question um, at stake in that council. Nestorius clearly came down on the side of the mother of Christ, the Christotokos. He would say that the son dwells in uh, Jesus just as God dwells in a temple. The son dwelt in Jesus just as God dwells in a temple. That means that the divine son occupies a space provided by a human body. And so that makes Mary merely the vehicle of creating a human uh, instrument or a human temple for God to dwell in. And it's only after Mary constructs the infrastructure, you might say, that God comes and then dwells in that structure. So Mary makes the vehicle and then God occupies and drives it. That's the sort of view of Nestorius. 
So Mary is not the mother of God. Mary is the mother of that which God unites himself to. That would be Nestorius' view. The Council of Ephesus, formed in 431 AD, however, comes to oppose this. And the one who leads this council and leads opposition to Nestorius at this council is St. Cyril of Alexandria. You notice a lot of important people are coming from the city of Alexandria, a very important city at the time. Cyril of Alexandria lives a little later, well into the 5th century, and he will proclaim and eventually lead the council toward the conclusion that Mary is the Theotokos. Mary is the mother of God. And what that means, practically speaking, is that Jesus is fully human and fully divine from the moment of his conception. So Mary gives birth not only to a human vehicle that God unites himself to, but Mary truly gives birth to what is fully human and fully divine. Okay, the next major council, we'll skip ahead 20 years, not that much later, was the Council of Chalcedon. The Council of Chalcedon was convened by the Emperor Marcion in 451 AD, and its mission was to, to settle the dispute over monophysitism which in some ways was an overreaction against Nestorianism. Nestorianism said that Jesus has two natures, divine and human, and two persons that correspond to each of these natures. So this view was ultimately condemned because, well, the reasons we discussed before. It makes these two centers of activity, the Son of God and the human person Jesus, kind of attached to each other. They're merely in conjunction, operating in tandem for a while. And this also has the implication that they could detach, right? And go their own ways, come back together again. Monophysitism rejects this and says, no, the, the incarnation involves one nature and one person. Well, how can that be the case? Well, because this one nature is a mixture of God and human. It's a mixture of the divine and the human. And you have a single center of agency here, so you don't have that schizophrenia, but you have a sort of hybrid problem where this one new nature, because it's a mixture, because it's a combination of divine and human, necessarily has to be neither fully human nor fully divine, uh, but a, a mixture. Okay, so the Chalcedonian canon proclaims that we confess that one and the same Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, must be acknowledged into, into two natures without confusion or change, without division or separation. The distinction between the natures was never abolished by their union, but rather the character proper to each of the two natures was preserved as they came together in one person. So this wouldn't be in a lecture without a typo. So you notice on the second line there, the same Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, must be acknowledged in two natures. It should not be in two, it should be in two. So these two natures that are involved in the incarnation are united without being confused or changed, without being divided or separated. So we don't have a human compartment or divine compartment in Jesus. We don't have a mixture. That's what that word confusion means. And we don't have sort of a change where he can be more god at one point in life less god at another you might think he's an infant he's pretty much all human maybe he's got a little divine spark in him or divine seed he changes and becomes fully human by the resurrection no no chalcedon is rejecting that how does it do this well it says the distinction between the natures was never abolished by their union so they are distinct from each other and their character proper to them is preserved but nevertheless they come together completely and perfectly so notice the mode here of assertion it's really not so much proposing something positive it's rejecting something it's sort of saying here's what we can be sure about rejecting first we can say that there are two natures involved but they're not mixed they're not changeable, they're not proportioned, they don't have compartments, they're not divided, and they're certainly not separated from each other. And we know that those two natures are perfectly united, so 
we know that they're two natures, they're together. Beyond that, we're not going to provide a positive theory about how, because in a sense, to try to do that is to bring it down into human categories and human terms. So this is really where the position of the church differs in its method and in its approach from the heresies that it rejects. It's not so much saying, oh, we've got it figured out. We know the right answer. It's saying those who think they have it completely figured out need to take a step back because their confidence in knowing exactly how this mystery unfolds is leading them down false and destructive paths. So their conclusion is basically there are two natures involved, one single person acting through those two natures, which are at the same time distinct and yet perfectly united. And beyond that, we're going to just say it's a mystery. It's beyond our capacity to understand fully. And that itself is sort of a distinctive mark of its truly transcendent quality. Okay, so very briefly, what does Zia have to say about redemption? Well, the Incarnation has as its primary aim our salvation. God's primary intention in becoming human is to save us. And he does what's necessary to do this. He does what's necessary to bring us back into right relationship with him. However, he'll emphasize that our salvation is not predicated by a rejection of God's other covenants, particularly his covenants to Israel. And so God does not reject or abandon Israel. And therefore, Christians should never reject or abandon uh, the Jewish people. The Christian faith is not premised upon a belief that the Jewish people are deserted, abandoned, or cursed. In fact, exactly the opposite. And he quotes St. Paul's letter to the Romans very effectively in this regard. He also emphasizes that God's suffering, or that God saves us by suffering. God brings about our salvation through an act of suffering love. In Jesus, God is suffering with us and for us. And it's really the cross that fully reveals the depth of God's love for us. And also at the same time, the height of our worth as human beings. God would do this for us. The cross also gives meaning to our own suffering by showing us that, in a sense, our humanity provides a common ground through which we can share in Christ's suffering. Our suffering is the same sort of suffering that Christ suffered. We share in common the experience of suffering in our bodies, in our spirits. And so this unites us with Christ in a way. And from the other end, the cross gives meaning to our suffering because Christ has already shared in it. Uh, there's really a beautiful Christian belief that if Christ died for each and every person, then if you were the only person who ever existed, Christ still would have come and offered himself for you and would have been willing to suffer for you alone. So Christ wasn't just dying for a general category of the human race when he died on the cross. He was dying for each and every single person. And what does that mean? That means that each and every single person's sins, each and every person's sufferings was there in Christ's mind, in Christ's heart as he was suffering. So whatever you're going through, it was in the mind and heart of Christ as he was suffering there on the cross. It was already there. And the task of the Christian is really to live out that suffering in a way that unites it to Christ's own understanding of what it means. Uh, and our suffering in, can in this way be redeemed. Finally, the resurrection. The resurrection is in a certain sense superfluous. Because Christ's death is what affects our salvation. But nevertheless, without the resurrection, the message of the meaning of Christ's sacrifice would probably have gone unheeded, unnoticed, ununderstood. It's really the resurrection that proclaims Christ's victory to us. So why did Jesus have to rise again? Mainly to, to tell the human race that death is not the end of the story. Right, so Jesus dies, and maybe you could just very easily believe, oh, there goes another one, right? Uh, there goes a good person that we've managed to kill, that powerful people have managed to silence. But Jesus' resurrection is really the convincing evidence that Jesus has conquered death, that his death cannot contain him, that his love is more powerful than our violence, that he's transformed death itself into life. 
And so Christians believe that Jesus is alive, that he lives, that he's risen again, and that this is the case both now and forever, that Jesus is alive and will never die again. One interesting thing that Zia mentions, though, which has a biblical basis to it in the Gospels, Jesus, when he rises again, still bears the wounds of his passion. So he doesn't rise perfect. Very interesting. He still has the wounds from the nails. His suffering is just not merely erased. His wounds are, are not forgotten, but they're sanctified in a way. They're transformed. They become marks of love, signs of glory, trophies of victory, you might even say. And so it raises the question, at least for us, our own wounds that we bear within us. Uh, will they just disappear when we have come to our own redemption and salvation? Will our wounds just simply be gone in heaven? Or will they be there and take on a completely different meaning in light of Christ's transformation of them? Okay, so that's our time for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, next class, we will continue to talk about... Uh, the ramifications and the effects of the Incarnation in the world. And we'll be getting eventually into the Trinity and then uh, specifically uh, the Holy Spirit and the Church down the road. So that's what's in store. I look forward to interacting with you on the discussion boards, perhaps seeing you at the live meetings. Uh, God bless. <laughs>